the year 1950, a well-known Christian theologian and professor of medieval and Renaissance English at the University of Cambridge sat down and wrote what became one of the most popular children's fantasy novels of all times about four siblings, a magical wardrobe, and a land trapped in eternal winter. If you have never read C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a chance you watched or heard of the highly successful Disney adaptation released in 2005. Although the popularity of the novel is indisputable, the question of why this short and relatively simple children's novel written by a 64-year-old theologian with no children of his own has had such a lasting impact on decades of readers is a slightly more ambiguous topic. While seeking an answer, I discovered two conflicting interpretations of the work prevailing in the writings of reviewers and critics. Some readers, especially those familiar with Lewis's religious background, describe the novel as an allegory. Others, however, including Lewis himself, push back against an allegorical reading of the novel. Critic Peter J. Shackle explains that, quote, Lewis insisted that the novel was not allegorical, but suppositional. Suppose there was a world like Narnia, and that Christ chose to be incarnate and die and rise again in that world. This is what it might have been like, unquote. Readers like Shackle, who see the novel as something other than allegory, most frequently take an archetypal approach and often use the words myth and fairy tale when speaking of the work. Through my careful analysis of critics' interpretations of The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, and my own study of the work, I have come to the conclusion that an archetypal reading best accounts for the novel's enduring power. So what are archetypes? A word coined by psychoanalyst Carl Jung, archetype is defined by critic Northrop Frye as, quote, a symbol, usually an image, which recurs often enough in literature to be recognizable as an element of one's literary experience as a whole, unquote. Archetypes draw upon the concept of primordial images, which William Harmon and Clarence Hugh Holman say are, quote, shaped by the repeated experiences of our ancestors and expressed in myths, religion, dreams, fantasies, and literature. In simpler terms, archetypes are patterns repeated across literature of different time periods and cultures. There are archetypal plots, the hero's journey, for instance, archetypal images and objects. Think of a magical wand or a poisonous apple. Um, and there are archetypal characters. You've probably encountered your fair share of orphan heroes and wicked stepmothers. Readers of all ages and cultures are able to unconsciously recognize patterns within a novel and link these to other stories they have heard or read. This makes, this makes fantasy worlds subconsciously familiar and predictable places, places where the reader feels safe and in control. Readers are also able to consciously or unconsciously connect arch archetypal patterns to their experiences in the real world, since archetypes in literature mirror types of real life events and real life people. When readers make these connections, their experiences in the fantasy world become meaningful beyond the pages of the book. I believe that a main reason the characters in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe are so highly praised is that they are based on archetypes. Lewis successfully harnesses the power of archetypes to create characters that are recognizable, understandable, and real to readers. Focusing on the contrasting characters, the White Witch and Aslan, provides a clear illustration of the effectiveness of archetypes in Lewis's novel and a persuasive reading against a straightforward allegorical reading. Now, if the novel were meant to allegorically represent the creation fall redemption story found in the Bible, Lewis's villain would certainly represent the devil. However, Lewis explicitly states that his antagonist the White Witch, who has stolen the rightful throne of Narnia and cast the land in endless winter, is meant to be Lilith, or Circe, a female archetype more generally known as the Temptress, and quite distinct from devil-type characters. In the story, the protagonist's friendly animal guide, Mr. Beaver, says, quote, She's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's first wife. Her, they called Lilith. 
In Hebrew mythology, Lilith was created by God from dirt and commanded by God to lie with Adam. She disobeyed this command, had relations with demons, and frequently threatened to murder Adam's offspring. According to critic Heather L. Blastel, different cultures' mythologies portray Lilith in a huge variety of roles, and she has, quote, throughout the centuries come to encompass every female villain the world's misogynistic societies could create, unquote. Lewis himself connects the White Witch with the Lilith archetype by describing her as Circe, another character linked to Lilith. He says, quote, the White Witch is, of course, Circe, Alcina, etc., because she is, or they are, the same archetype we find in so many fairy tales, unquote. Whether you've heard of Lilith and Circe or not, you've almost definitely encountered villains that follow the temptress patterns. And because of that, you'd instantly recognize the type of character the White Witch is as a result of certain key characteristics. Shackle summarizes these traits as follows. Each tempts its prey, hates human beings, and epitomizes selfishness, cruelty, and desire for control, unquote. The White Witch tempts her prey with magical food, the iconic Turkish delights that Edmund Pevensey becomes so intoxicated with that he betrays his entire family. She also clearly hates human beings, frequently using the words brat, fool, and vermin to describe the Pevensey siblings and showing no compassion towards them regardless of their suffering. And finally, cruelty and desire for control are exhibited in many of her behaviors, including her method of murder itself turning her victims to stone, thereby exercising complete control over them. As I mentioned before, Lewis's choice of villain is unexpected for many readers who anticipate encounters with the devil in a book by a Christian author. I would argue, however, that Lewis was quite intentional with his choice of villain. Lewis selects the temptress archetype with the knowledge that young readers will instantly recognize her from having encountered similar villains in other fairy tales. He makes it really easy for readers to bring her to life in their imaginations. Lewis may also have selected the Lilith archetype thinking that she would be more relatable to readers. In support of this idea, critic Sarah McLaughlin claims that of all the characters in Narnia, her four-year-old daughter was fascinated most by, quote, the idea of the White Witch, who pretended to be Queen of Narnia, unquote, because her daughter was, quote, able to relate this to the warnings that she had heard regarding strangers who seem to be nice people, but are not, unquote. In reality, one rarely encounters villains as obviously evil as the devil. Real world villains veil their evil with sweet praises and tempting promises, just as the White Witch does. So, by selecting a temptress, as his antagonist, Lewis creates a villain who is familiar and real to readers, and thus deeply terrifying. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the opponent to the White Witch is Aslan, a lion and the only character capable of defeating the White Witch's powers. In the words of Mr. Beaver, quote, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight, unquote. By far, one of Aslan's most memorable traits is that he takes the form of a lion. Readers who are familiar with biblical scriptures may recognize the lion as the animal most frequently used to represent Christ in the Bible, a fact that may help some readers more quickly identify Aslan as the Christ figure of this story. Because Aslan is the one who ultimately defeats the White Witch, he is often actually misidentified as the hero of the story. In other sections of my thesis, I discuss in depth how the Pevensey siblings actually fulfill the role of hero. Aslan, on the other hand, can be identified as a Christ character through certain key characteristics. Readers will recognize, for instance, Aslan's abundance of virtues. Lewis describes him as both powerful as well as merciful, loving, and gracious. Mr. Beaver claims that Aslan is so powerful that the White Witch can barely manage, quote, to stand on her two feet and look him in the face, unquote. At the same time, his gentle love is made clear in the way he treats the Pevensey siblings, frequently comforting young Lucy and forgiving Edmund despite his betrayal of the nation. Wisdom is another integral characteristic for Christ archetypes in general. 
for in order to defeat the villain, wit and wisdom are often required. In fact, it is not Aslan's power, but his unrivaled understanding of deep magic and the law that allows him to trick the White Witch into taking his life instead of Edmund's. Because Aslan is an innocent victim, unlike, um, unlike Edmund, Lewis explains that, quote, death itself works backwards, unquote, when the White Witch kills him. By voluntarily sacrificing himself, Aslan defeats his opponent. Lewis makes it clear that his death is not a result of weakness or failure of virtues, but actually quite the opposite. Aslan recognizes that the only way to save those he loves is to lay down his own life, and so he bravely and honorably sacrifices himself. By assigning Aslan these specific traits, Lewis creates a character that readers know right away to trust and place their hope in. His presence makes the story one characterized by hope rather than fear. Now, to jump to the conclusion that Aslan is Jesus Christ in the story is really to make an overly simplified equivalent. Aslan does indeed draw on readers' familiarity with Jesus Christ, since he is one of the earliest and most well-known portrayals of Christ, but the two are not meant to be equated. When comparing Aslan and Jesus, certain key differences become clear. Mark Freshwater notes, for instance, that after Aslan's resurrection, the lion remains restrained by the same physical limitations as before his death, unlike Jesus, who transcends physical limitations and actually ascends into heaven. The more important difference between Aslan and Jesus, however, is that Aslan uses deception to secure Edmund's salvation. The White Witch unwittingly trades the life of Edmund for the life of Aslan. And because Aslan, as I said earlier, is a willing victim, um, the law actually prohibits her from taking his life. Um, and as I mentioned before, that means death itself works backwards. In the Bible, however, no such clear act of deception takes place. Lewis himself actually stated his desires for readers to connect Aslan's death and resurrection to, quote, those queer stories scattered all through the heathen religions about a God who dies and comes to life again, and by his death has somehow given new life to men." Unquote. In other words, Aslan draws on the power of centuries of Christ characters in literature, mythology, and religion, not just Jesus Christ. Now those who assume that Aslan's sacrifice exists in the novel as a direct representation of Jesus's crucifixion are essentially viewing the scene as a theological argument, primarily meant to speak to readers' minds. In doing so, they can miss out on the unique and enjoyable experiencing, experience of witnessing Aslan trick the White Witch and cleverly save Narnia from winter. Aslan's sacrifice really shouldn't speak only to the mind, but also to the heart. His resurrection really should fill readers' heart with hope and joy, feelings that transfer over to whatever challenges they may be facing in the real world. Allowing Aslan to function as the Christ archetype Lewis created him to be, rather than forcing him into an allegorical interpretation, makes this more full and multifaceted enjoyment possible. We now return to our original question. Why does the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe have such a powerful impact on readers? As a professor and writer of many great apologetic works, Lewis spent ample time speaking to readers' minds. His intellectual arguments have succeeded in sparking more than a few conversions to Christianity. But with the writing of his imaginative Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis found a new way to deliver his message of hope. Through the words and actions of fictional characters that readers readily invite into their hearts. Whether readers are conscious of it or not, they enter the world of Narnia as questioning individuals, every mind containing some uncertainty about the workings of the world, the power of good and evil, and the purpose of life. Lewis recognized that he could provide answers to these questions through fiction. In the words of Alistair McGrath, author of the standard biography about Lewis, Lewis came to the belief that imaginative works should, quote, be seen as a legitimate and positive use of the human imagination challenging the limits of reason, and opening the door to a deeper apprehension of reality." Unquote. 
with the plot of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lewis poses this important question. Will good triumph over evil? By journeying along with Lewis's archetypal characters, fighting the white witch, witnessing Aslan's death, and rejoicing at his resurrection, readers discover the answer they have been hoping for from the start. Thank you for listening to my presentation.